Hello, I'm Robert, and these are some of the programs that I've written for Windows. And the aim of this Kickstarter is to get them all running on a Mac. Sadly, it won't work on an iPhone or an iPad because of the type of processor you have inside. It's only going to work on an Intel Mac. And the reward you will get is an unlock key for all these programs. And you can use this straight away, for instance, on a friend's computer or if you have got a Windows computer. And then once I've got it ported to the Mac and working and running fine, then you'll be able to download these programs and unlock them on your Mac. And these programs, it's a mixture of musical and artistic come geometry. And let's have a look and see what they do. So first let's look at one of the geometrical ones. This is virtual flower, and this I call a star sphere. There's a kind of underlying geometry, and on top of that you put these stars that sway back and forth. There are many other geometrical shapes that you can explore, so there's uh, star pyramids and uh, 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 prisms, anti-prisms, all sorts of complex geometrical shapes if you're into that sort of thing. And it's also, it's very good for exploring uh, four-dimensional space and five-dimensional space as well. Geometrical shapes that you can get, that you don't get in three dimensions. And there's a connection there with music because there's some musical structures you can make in four and five dimensions. And you can actually use a virtual flower to output these and together with one of my other programs you can get it to make these musical geometries which you can then uh, click on you can click on the these geom on the vertices and you get various pitches sounding and chords and triads then another thing that you can do with virtual flower and yeah, that is where its name comes from is you can make these as you see geometrical shapes that look very much like trees or like flowers you can just go to the virtual cut flower Dot net website and you will find you can find out all about what it does. Now this is the one that people are really really excited about seeing on the Mac, the uh, musicians. And if you are a musician, you're interested in complex rhythms. I get asked uh, emails over and over again by musicians who are astonished by what this program can do. So I don't think I need to say too much about that. Just have a look down the page at some of the rhythms on this page. Go over to the, uh, let's bring this up full screen. Go over to the Bound Spectrum website and you'll find lots of videos there of the rhythms it can play. And then you can go over to the Robert Inventor YouTube channel and you'll find yet more. There are well over 600 videos of some of the very many different rhythms that Bound Spectrum can play. Anyway, so I, I, I'm going to show you a very simple thing in Bounce Metronome, but it's to, you'll find this on the page, but just to explain a bit of the idea behind it. So I set this running. This is called Solo, the Funny Sorcerer, and you can download this character to try out in Bounce, to use in Bounce Metronome. It's an open source uh, character, so I can't actually include it, but you can include it and I have permission to use it in the video. So if you follow it, then you get this uh, you get this rather nice bounce effect. And it's very easy to follow as a human as a human being. It's very easy to follow this bounce effect. And it brings a very good energy into your music practice. And then the other thing to notice apart from the bounce is that the way it's following the conducting pattern, it's going back and forth, it goes up higher just before the first beat in the measure or bar. And another high beat there, and then like that, another high beat will jump across. This makes it very easy to follow the rhythm out of the corner of your eye. I'm just stopping it. Now, there's, you can also have it bouncing back and forth, like I have it over there, and many other different ways you can have it bouncing. It's actually using ideas from conductors, but it's not trying to exactly copy the way conductors conduct, but it's using some of the techniques that are the basis of conducting in order to present rhythms in a very crisp and clear way on the computer screen. 
because it does it, the divisions are so precise and easy to follow in that way, then you can actually use it without any sound at all. And substitute for a click track, for instance. Instead of a click track, just have the visuals. And then this also makes it very good for deaf musicians. So it doesn't matter if you can't hear the click at all. And it also makes it very good if you play a loud instrument, like for instance the drums or piano, it doesn't matter if you draw on the click. And then uh, this leads into the accessibility of my programs. So I return that to its place and go back. This is my other program, TuneSmithy. And when I, the, I first got an email uh, from a blind musician who was using TuneSmithy many years ago, saying how much he appreciated that I, here was a music program finally that he could use as a blind musician. And I really had no idea at that point. All I'd done, I hadn't done anything special, I had just followed the Windows accessibility guidelines. But it turns out that many music programs don't do that. And they're simply completely unusable to blind musicians. So they, I, I've been very careful since then. I test them with screen readers and I make sure that all my programs can be used by blind musicians. And Bounce Metronome, I have many blind musicians now who use Bounce Metronome for that reason. And uh, again, I, I continue getting these appreciative emails saying, isn't it great how, how great it is that I finally get a metronome that I can use as a, as a blind musician and, uh, and explore all these rhythms and things, which is previously was completely locked out. And so uh, it's also very accessible. I also follow the accessibility guidelines for high contrast visuals. And so if you need high contrast visuals, this is another area where modern music programs are almost impossible to use if you need high contrast visuals, many of them. And if you have your display set to say white on black or black on white, TuneSmithy and Bounce Metronome, uh, Bounce Metronome certainly will automatically uh, come up as black on white and white on black. I'm not sure I, if I've got a preset in TuneSmithy yet, because that's the older program for this. I, I, I can work on that. So uh, and so you can and you can adjust all the colours in, in, in the display and the textures and everything, so as to to fit whatever your visual requirements are. And so, okay, now let's start. I was talking about TuneSmithy. Let's have a look at TuneSmithy next. Then the idea of TuneSmithy it originally came from uh, this was back in the 1980s, I think, and. I, I'm a mathematician, that's what, what my, my background is. And so I just had this idea, following, compared with other things, like the uh, mathematical, mathematics behind virtual flower and how you get these trees forming, then you get trees are formed in a geometrical way and they're also in clouds and, and uh, running water and mountains and things like that. We have details within details where details look very much like the whole thing. I thought, what about applying this to music? And so that's what happens with TuneSmithy. And then years later, just a couple of years ago, I discovered that this, there's this, uh, I have to maximize this to see it, Per Nogat, he is a Danish composer. And he came up with um, an integer sequence as well, very similar idea. And it's a, a, a rather unusual for a composer, then his integer sequence now appears in the Sloan online database of, of integer sequences. So he uses this in his music, as a, along with a lot of compositional technique, of course, he's a composer and he writes symphonies using this, his sequence. Now, in TuneSmithy, then uh, if there's no composition, there's no uh, standard composition going on there at all. All it is doing is just generating the, these numbers and making them into music. And it turns out this makes automatically makes a sloth canon where every music instrument is playing the same melody line at a different speed. So let's listen to one of these and hear what happens. So here's the tiny seed phrase and everything you hear 
it's generated from this. It's that little tulip. Now, if I put this through the magical sloth cannon process, this is what you get. And then, so I wanted to show to you how you can change any of the, change this very easily. Uh, long window, C chart. I should get my glasses properly. There we go. So now, if I set that running, and I, I adjust the notes here, then you just change one of the notes. And as you move the notes around, notice how the whole tune ch changes. And so you can just play around with that until you get something that you like the sound of. And uh, as you can see, it's very unlike ordinary composition. You can't adjust an individual note in the tune. You just, if you just one of these notes, the entire tune changes. And you don't need to be at all mus uh, musically trained to use this. As you saw, I was just clicking on the screen. You can also type in the notes as numbers, or you can, you can if you're a musician, or uh, you can play a musical phrase, and you can play it from your keyboard or whatever, and then it'll turn into one of these one of these things. And then you also have a randomize now button and you click the randomize and it'll make a random tune using a mixture of uh, settings from the various different tunes that come with the program. And again, the several hundred tunes that come with the program. So you can try these out as well and just listen to them, just play them in for enjoyment as well. Then another thing you can do with TuneSmithy, I'll show you the Let's see if we can find Mouse and PC keyboard music. And if I go here and I bring up the keyboard, then you can use it to play music from your PC keyboard and using your mouse. And this is great if you're, uh, and it's microtone music, so you can put it in any tuning system you like. So it's great if you're for the traveling microtone list on a plane and you just want to, while you're while away, uh, trying out some ideas in different tuning systems, then you can just get out tune smithy and get out your keyboard and start playing away. This is actually a, a, a pygmy scale, uh, just with, I'm not playing anything particularly, just showing you how it works. So, so that you can just get that out and play it on and play it on your uh, wherever you like. Then the other thing that you can use TuneSpithy for is for retuning your compositions into any tuning system. And the way it works is that you could. For instance, you have a composition and you can turn, for instance, the octave of the composition in Sibelius or Fidali, say, into an octave and a half, if you like, and stretch it. Or you can make, move any of the notes, wherever you like, in the entire frequency range on, on your score. And this opens the world to tuning it to a very easy method of composing, so there's no score in TuneSmithy itself, no editable score, but you do it in another program and then you use TuneSmithy for retuning it. In a similar way, you can also retune your music keyboard. And so anyway, if you're into bugtool music, chances are you have something like this already, but you may well find that there's some things that TuneSmithy can do that, uh, that you haven't got in your existing program, because there's so many different things you can do in microtone music, and it adds to your toolbox of things that you can do. And if you're new to microtone music, then maybe it can help you get started.
But so now I'll show you the Chunsmethi Lamdoma, and this is used for music therapy. Uh, it's an arrangement of pitches that goes back to the Greeks, to Pythagoras, and Barbara Hero brought that into the 20th and 21st century. And she devised the, the colours and the visage patterns and the idea of using this in music therapy. And they find that it had, seems to have healing properties using it. And uh, with various ideas about how it works, but at any rate, you certainly you get very harmonious pitches that you can play and these uh, beautiful smooth shapes that you can make that, that appear on the screen as you play on the keyboard. So I can well understand why it would have healing therapeutic properties to do that. So let's have a look at the notes. So that's just a major chord. But then if you go a bit further up, you get an extra note that you don't get in the Western tuning system. And it's actually what you've got going that way is a, a harmonic series. And it goes further up to the 11th and the 13th harmonic. Again, notes that you don't get in the Western tuning system. And then if you go in the other direction, then you have minor chord this way. And that is actually based on a subharmonic series. And there's another, and that's a note that you don't get in the Western tuning system down there. And so you, it's a way of interrelating, it's sort of tiny, kind of major sounding chords and minor sounding chords interrelating to make this kind of matrix. And you, they, these come, there's, there's the major chord there, you also get it, the same thing there, and transposed up and up in different positions. So the, all the harmonic series that way, the subharmonic series that, the subharmonic series that way, and they interrelate together to make this matrix of pitches. And so anyway, you can try that out. Now do notice as, as I change the notes that these patterns here change and these larger patterns are changing as I press notes down. So if I press a few notes down and you get a pattern appear over there. Now there's a thing that I've added recently to this, uh, the rhythms capability. The way this works is that each pitch is playing at a slightly faster tempo depending on the pitch. It's an idea that was explored by an American composer in the 20th century, and I, I used it in the Chunspiti Lamdoma because uh, Barbara here was asking, can we have a way of the rhythm depending on the pitch and put that into, into a Chunspiti uh, Lamdoma? And this was the obvious way to do it. So if you have a listen to what it sounds like, And then you can add and remove notes, and you get a different one sounding. Now notice how that one at the bottom are very slow, different speeds, like that. That's a very low pitch one. And the other ones are playing polyrhythmically with it. So anyway, that's how that works. And so you can try that out for yourself uh, once you've got the programs and you can play around and see if you feel that it does have therapeutic healing uh, properties on, on your body. But whether or not, it's, it's actually it's just great fun to play around with it anyway. Uh, so now what else have we got? Well, do you notice how the visual patterns, the Lissage 3 patterns changed? And these are in two dimensions. When you get to three notes, then you get these complex patterns, when they're just two notes, then it's a very simple one, where it's just going back and forth one way and back and forth the other way. This is a geometrical way of showing the way that the two frequencies are related to each other. And when you've got two, you just have one frequency that way and one that way. But when you get to a three note chord, then you always have the question, to where do you put the third frequency? Because you've only got two directions. So the various solutions you can do in 2D have both of them in the same direction, have one of them at a slant or whatever. But a very natural thing is to have the third direction into the third dimension when you have a three-note chord. But I never thought of that until Charles Lucy, and he's the composer uh, of the Lucy tune lullabies. Anyway, 
he uh, suggested to me, uh, what about putting it in three dimensions? And this was what came out as a result. I've now added transparency and textures and you get these rather lovely patterns. I was really, I wasn't surprised, very surprised at how well it turned out and how beautiful the results were. And then this, you can run these patterns as a screensaver and uh, I, you certainly can on Windows. I don't know how that works on a Mac but obviously that's one of the things that I can investigate and find out with it changing from one to another as the screen sawyer keeps going. And then you can also use it to make animations if you're into artistic animations, just like with virtual fur. Uh, but this, these are more like curves, that are curving kind of animations. So uh, that's what virtual, uh, what this Azure 3 d does. Now I think I've gone around most of my programs, but there's this one left. And this one is uh, Activity Timer and just a little utility that keeps track of how much time you spend on various projects. And so, for instance, it can say you have spent so much on Kickstarter, so much on Truthsmithy, so much on Advanced Metronome, or whatever. Now, I've just done this for demonstration because I don't actually need to know how much long I've spent on projects at the moment. But if you do need to, then this is a useful program. And then the other thing it can do is it can, if you tend to find that you get rather square-eyed, that if you sit on the computer you tend to find there's something a little bit hypnotic about the uh, computer screen, I think most people would agree. And it also tends to, there's something it does to your eyes, it's probably something to do with the frequency of refresh of the display. Maybe not so much now as it was, but still a little bit of an issue. It tends to, you can't focus quite so clearly on the computer screen as you can compute, focus on other things because of the refresh rate, uh, at least I, I hope some people think. So your eyes get very tired looking at the computer screen if you look at it continuously for a long period of time. Anyway, whatever the reasons, technical reasons why it, uh, many people do find their eyes do get tired, and it's good to have a reminder. And every 20 minutes you can get a little musical reminder that pops up or whatever time you want, time interval you want to set. And this is just a reminder to move your eyes away from the screen, look into the distance, and relax your eyes uh, just for a few seconds and that's a very good practice to do that every 20 minutes or so when you're using a computer and then there's also the thing that just physically sitting on your computer all day is bad for your health and uh, I'm definitely recommending that you get up and walk around at least every hour and a half or something like that even if you want to continuously work on the computer and of course it's good to take a break as well it refreshes you so that you can set up a reminder, activity, you can set up to have a reminder after an hour and a half just to get up off your seat for a few minutes at least before you continue working again. So that's what Activity Timer does. And so I think I've now gone around all of my programs. So I'll talk now about the uh, porting them over to the Mac and what that involves. So, first of all, I'm extremely optimistic it's going to work because if you look over here, this is Bounce Metronome and you've seen it uh, running away all through while I'm talking probably, then that is running, actually not on Windows, that is running on the Linux operating system. And the technique I use for that is this thing called Wine. You can read in the page, later on the page, or probably I'll put it in the FAQ, about how this all works. But the long and short of it is that it is very high performance, that there's almost nothing in between my code and the actual native hardware. The code that I write runs exactly as is on a native Mac. That's why uh, it won't work on an iPad or an iPhone, because the code is Intel code. But it'll run exactly as is on your, on your Intel Mac, and then all the things like drawing circles and so on, then there's a very thin layer between my program and the actual native code that draws circles on your computer. So this means it's very high performance, potentially. And 
it's, uh, there's no virtual machine in between my program and the hardware. And then also the 3D graphics, then I will be able to do that straight onto your uh, graphics card as well using OpenGL. So that will be very accelerated and fast as well. So given that it's completely impossible, I'm, it would be 10 years of someone's work to rewrite everything for the Mac. Then this is the, it would be just immensely expensive, quarter, half million pounds probably to pay someone to do that, if you could find someone to do it. But this is a way that we can do this really very easily and quickly compared with that. And probably within a week or two or maybe months at the most, we can have these programs all running on the Mac. The reason that they won't probably run straight away is just because Wine is not Windows. It's, uh, it's, Wine is developed as a free source, open source, completely from scratch and they follow the documentation for Windows, but they don't use any of the Microsoft source code. This means there can be very subtle differences between the two. This is also the reason why it's completely free and legal to use it. So there'll be no additional cost for my programs once I've wrapped them around this. Of course you're getting the programs anyway, but later on when people are buying the programs, then they won't need to pay any extra for the, for the buying. And you don't need to install anything on your computer. Now, if on Linux, then you do need to install Wine on Linux if you want to use my program on Linux. And then you also have to set up these other things to make it produce sounds. But on the Mac, the way it works is very different. On the Mac, you have what's called a Wine skin. And I have to install Wine on my computer, and I use that to wrap Wine around my program. And then I make that into something that looks exactly like a Mac program. And you just need to download that and use it on your computer. And inside of it, it's actually got the whole of Windows wrapped around it. And, but Wine, luckily, it hasn't got any bloat. It's, it hasn't got all the fancy extra add-ons that, that they use to make, um, that they use in, in uh, Windows, if in the full multi-gigabyte operating system. So it's only 140 megabytes, maybe it'll be 150 megabytes once it's got my program in. I might be able to cut it down less than that. That's quite reasonable size for a modern program. If you are on a very slow connection, you'll also be able to get it on CD. So you are actually, you don't need to install anything on your computer. You will download this big program, which will have the whole of Windows inside of it. And also any tech configuring that I have to do to get it to work in mine. And if I need to install extra things like these extra programs to make it work, then you don't need to do that. It's all just wrapped up in this bundle. So you just download it, put it, and it just looks like a single program to the Mac, and you just double click and run it. And when you run it, you don't see any of this stuff either. It will just run like any ordinary Mac program, and you'll see uh, you'll see advanced metronome or transmitter or whatever it is just running on your desktop like any other Mac program. I had no idea until last year when I ported this to the Linux how seamless and how good this is, this wine method. Now, there'll be a lot of work for me to do to make it work like that because of these subtle differences that it's just like working and debugging on Windows and improving the performance of my programs on Windows, which I've done for many, many years but there will be some subtle differences, which means there might even be bugs where it doesn't even start at all. Those are usually very easy to fix. And then there might also be some kind of performance issues. Anyway, you can read through the challenges section if you want the technical details about all that. No in short is, I'm very confident that I should be able to uh, deal with all those things as they arrive, especially since I've already got it running on Windows. There's a minor technical thing if you're a musician, I'm not totally sure that I'll be able to get MIDI timing working perfectly on a Mac. I have ways of dealing with that. If it does prove to be an issue, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. But if the MIDI timing turns out to be an issue because of the interface through Wine to the Mac, then Bounce Metronome will be able to also use, you've got the Beeps Metronome, and it also can use samples of drum samples and such like. This is a new feature that I'm going to add to it next week. And so that will mean that you'll be able to have a very precise metronome and playing these rhythm very precisely on nice sounds, no matter what. So I'm extremely confident that we're going to get all of this working on the Mac. 
I, I just I can't totally say 99.99% certain. I can't totally say because I simply haven't done it. And but many programs have, including also many games. And games, of course, put a lot of demands on the Mac, and they run just fine. Uh, and so I'm very confident that I'll be able to get Mark's metronome running fine on the Mac. And so uh, that's it. Now I just talk a little bit about the uh, edges and the reward. So just one, one thing I want to mention, so it's a little bit unusual. Let me get over to that screen somehow. I'm uh, using the wrong mouse. Then if you have a look at the Kickstarter page, then you'll find on the right hand side all these pledges. To find out what you get, which I've already explained, then go to the £12 pledge and you have a long explanation of the reward. It's basically I'm not for all the programmes. And the deadline, December of this year, but actually it could be much uh, before that that I would actually get it uh, programmed for Mac, but you get the unlock keys 14 days after the end of the Kickstarter. Now the unusual thing is that you that all the pledges have exactly the same reward. So I just want to say a little bit about that and why that is. It's because the use of my programs comes from so many diverse backgrounds. And for instance, if you are an Indian musician and you get paid in rupees, and you convert your rupees into US dollars in order to buy uh, software, then you will find that your rupees get into and turn into very little in the way of US dollars. A huge amount of rupees can turn into just very little by way of US dollars, just because of the way the exchange rate works. And there's nothing, you know, I mean, there's no reason at all for it. I don't know why it happens. I'm no economist, economist as to why that is. But there's nothing, you, I mean, you're just a musician, you're an Indian musician. Why should it be like that? Well, I've done it so that my programs uh, can, you can just choose whatever price is appropriate, depending on your situation. So if you're in India, then you can go for the one pound uh, pledge or the, or the one pound version of Barnes Metronome. And the same thing can also happen if you are in, uh, in the West and if you have in, U in Europe or in the States or anywhere else where there's a very high incomes, then you know, Japan or wherever, then you, uh, you still might be in the situation where you have a lot of incoming, a uh, lot of income coming in, but you have a lot of outgoings as well. And things that you absolutely have to pay for one reason or another. And then at the end of the month, there can be maybe very little margin between the two. So you get people who are quite hard up in Western countries as well, or in European and the United States and all these other places. And if you're in that situation, and that you have to save up for uh, a month or two months in order to find £12, then uh, please don't do that. Just go and choose whatever level you can find straight away. So that's how I do it with my programs. That's how I'm doing it with Kickstarter. And uh, you don't need to, if you find yourself hesitating, can I find this amount, then go for a lower price level. The kind of standard level, and, and even though I reassure everyone of that, and the moment I, I start with, I was, rather scared about doing this, I thought everyone would just go for the one pound level. But it doesn't work like that. And in practice, most people go for the full price. And the equivalent of full price for this Kickstarter is the 12 pounds level. And then the equivalent of educational is the six pounds level, and then for retired is the three pounds level. These are much lower price, quite a bit lower price, especially if you buy all the software. But it's uh, Obviously, you're not going to get it until 14 days after the end of the Kickstarter, and it's uh, your chance are you've got a Mac anyway. And I've put higher pledges as well, so if you uh, feel you can support it, you want to support it at a higher level, then you can go all the way up to £100 and you have exactly the same reward. And very much appreciated if you want to support it at whatever level. And and the other way that you can help, as well as by pledging, is by telling people about it. And in many ways, this is as useful, more helpful than, than, than pledging for it. So if you, uh, if people who you think would be interested in it, who would appreciate it, 
And of course you wouldn't, for instance, post about it to the Linux Musicians Forum or something like that. So be careful not to spam. But in, uh, in any place where there's people who really uh, like to be keen and interested in seeing Bart's metronome for the Mac, then, and, and for your friends, social media, uh, any, anything like that, then that's a great help. And uh, so, uh, thanks very much. So, anyway, let's hope that one way or another we can get these, all these programs running on, the, on an Intel Mac. And if we hit this, this target, oh, and just the one thing, I, I must explain why I'm doing it for, why I have to get an Intel Mac for myself and why I can't just to test it on Windows. That's what I do on the, with Linux. It's a free operating system. It's very easy to put it onto Windows. And so that was no problem at all. In the case of the Mac operating system, then I can buy it, certainly. I could, you, you could go and buy the Mac operating system, but and technically there's no reason, it's exactly the same chip, or pretty much the same chip. You would think there's no reason why you can't run it on Windows. But of course, Apple Mac are a hardware company, and they're interested in selling Macs, and the op operating system will not run on any hardware except an Apple Mac. It checks to see if it's running on what it's running on, and it will just refuse to start if I were to try to run it on one of these computers. So that is why I have to get... It's quite understandable. I mean, obviously, that's how, that they, they probably wouldn't have had the success and been able to reach the stage they are now if they hadn't done that. So uh, that's why I have to get an Intel Mac in order to do this. I, I don't, I, anyone will do as long as it runs the latest operating system. There's no extra requirements apart from that. And so uh, that's, that's it. And that's what the Kickstarter is all about. And if you want to help in any way, then that's very much appreciated. Uh, thanks very much. And if you have any questions at all, then be sure to contact me about that as too. And thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed this video.